1978, there were no Turkish Star conferences in America. They originated from the Middle East, Southern Asia, and Northern Africa. So, in 1978, in Lathrop, California, um, we found them at Sharp Army Depot for the very first time. One year later, they were found in El Paso, Texas at Fort Bliss, which is another military base. By the mid-1980s, we found them in southern Arizona. One of our extension entomologists, Dr. Sutherland, also remembers them in Las Cruces, New Mexico. By the early 2000s, schools were reporting this cockroach in their premises in Los Angeles, California. Our last report comes from Fort McPherson, Georgia, another military base. As you can see, these cockroaches like the Southwest. They're adapted for hot and dry environments like the Middle East is, but they can go to hot and humid environments like it is in Georgia. These animals are highly commercialized in reptile pet trade. They make excellent feeders because they like to run around and they don't burrow like other cockroaches would. They're also really fast to reproduce and they're easy to care for, which can make them potentially spread. So where do the Turkestans actually live? They live outside in leaf litter the leaves and other organic material. You can find them in animal barns, which is where we found them most at New Mexico State University. They eat um, like leftover food from the animals, which is what they're eating on right now. And they will also um, eat the stuff that comes out of the animal. Um, you can find them in water meter boxes. They obtain a lot of moisture from them and shelter. And occasionally they come into our buildings, making them a nuisance. They come in through cracks in walls or underneath the base of the foundation. If you place to be trapped out, you will most likely catch Turkestan cockroaches. Here, we were at um, a feed mill at New Mexico State University, where they grind up corn. And you can see all of these cockroaches um, feeding in there, and they were mating. And I witnessed them mating in the wild, so I wanted to know what was going on. So um, the male is the lighter one, right here with the wings, and the female is the darker one without the wings. There are this one right here is a male. Um, there's one over here that's a male. And there's one more male. So I want to know what are they doing? So I took them to the lab. Can you this, please? Thank you. And this is what I discovered that they were doing. The female silks on her legs and rubs her three four eyes segments against a substrate. Our substrate was a really tall, peachy dish that was made out of glass. And I put a lid on it so they wouldn't escape. So she's doing this, and the male goes to investigate, what is she doing? His antennae are fluttering, his wings will flutter, and he'll go and smell where she was rubbing. I found that to be a calling behavior, which is characterized in other cockroach species and it precedes me, which is what they're doing. He lifts up his wings, she climbs on top of his abdomen, he forces his abdomen under her, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> they will connect their abdomens together, their posterior ends, and they will twist, and copulation will occur. So I wanted to go further into what is this calling behavior? Because in other cockroach species, they have, in other cockroach species, 
they release like a sexual pheromone to attract their male over to them. So I want to know, is that what she's doing? So my research is based on the frequency of how often the calling behavior in a virgin female Turkestan happens, which is what she's doing right here. She's calling. But I also know that we see pain. So in the lab, I decided I might as well watch them. So I use a video tracking software called EcoVision. It's an amazing software. I took I took five five newly molted females. There's only four in the arenas because some of them were used over again. But every time I got a new female, I would place her in there and keep one of the old ones. I gave them food and water so they could live there for four days or more if need be. And I put a lid on them with an air hole so they couldn't escape. And they were kept in a condition where a light would turn on so they would have light and the light would automatically turn off so they'd be in the dark. So they had a photo period of 12 hours light and 12 hours dark. What I had discovered was astonishing. The females, shortly, 24 hours after scleritizing, meaning their exoskeleton is hard, they started calling, which doesn't really happen in other cockroach species. It takes four to five days in other cockroach species to do that. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I want to know more. So I kept recording. What I found was this graph which is a periodicity of calling behavior. So from the y-axis, you can see these are the percent of females calling. So that's 100%. And this is the time of day, oh, I'm sorry, from 0 to 24. The black represents dark, or photophase. The white represents light, or photophase. You can see that the females call in both Photophase and photophase. But oddly enough, they don't start calling until three hours into scotophase. And they call mostly during photophase, which is odd because they're supposed to be nocturnal creatures and not diurnal. So three hours in, they start calling. It stays gradual and nice until the 13th hour, which is one hour into the light, there's a huge spike. It's 62% of all those females were calling in the light, right there. And then it gradually declines to 24 hours. So they're calling for their males to come and do their business with them. So I decided, I want to further my research. I want to know, what are they doing? Because in other cockroach species, their calling behavior is associated with the release of these sexual pheromones. So I want to know, are there going to be sexual hormones? So I want to make whole body extractions of females, just females in general, virgin and non-virgin. See if there's something. I want to collect volatiles from the moment these cockroaches start calling. And then I want to get a male, put him in an olfactometer, and introduce him to these extracts. I want to see what is he going to do. Is he going to go to them, or is he not going to go to them? I'd like to acknowledge my lab manager, Brittany Blakely, for taking care of my cockroaches when I wasn't available to take care of them, and for helping me with the traps, and for being there. I'd like to thank the Animal Sciences Department at New Mexico State University for opening up their farms for me, for allowing me to be on their premises and for allowing me to observe these cockroaches in a natural habitat. I'd also like to thank the Archival Paso for supplying me with my very first cockroach colonies. Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, oh. are, you, are, those, are they about the size of German cockroaches? They're a lot they, larger. A lot larger? About, 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 about oriental size. size. They're related to orientals, same genus. You can mistake the female for a female oriental, and you can mistake a male for an American, and that's probably why they weren't noticed back in the 1970s.
Yes. Do they believe they're spreading more in the southeast? What do you think? The southeast is like where Georgia and Florida are. They potentially can because they're commercialized so much for reptility. So they're shipped all over America right now. So if a careless owner doesn't care and it escapes, there's a potential right there. Yes? So you mentioned that they began to show up on military bases specifically. Do you do you know why they're they did that or do you think it just that's where they spread? Possibly they came back with their military when they went to the Middle East since they originated from the Middle East and we sent our military to the Middle East the most. <laughs> There's a high chance that they laid eggs in their furniture or belongings and they brought them back. Any other questions? Officials, we have time for one